The Voices of the Enlisted Video Collection is dedicated to the members of the Air Force Sergeants Association, whose patriotism and dedication make them ultimate heroes for America. Your voices will be heard as we strive to lead the way to preserve and improve the quality of life and economic fairness for future generations to come. We salute the famous and the unsung, the well-known and the unknown. The Air Force Sergeants Association proudly presents the voices of the enlisted video collection, demonstrating the incredible courage of the men and women who bravely served our country. Each video in this remarkable series recounts in vivid detail their daily physical and emotional struggles. Feel the bond among the brave and see how war experiences affected not only their lives, but the lives of their families and all Americans. These stories and images bring to life the powerful realities of war, stories that are truly unforgettable. Virtually the entire flying arsenal of the United States fought the air war in Vietnam. Even propeller aircraft retired after the Korean War were called back to active duty and sent into combat alongside state-of-the-art jet fighters. The air war included the fiercest aerial bombardments in the history of warfare. Over six million tons of high explosives were dropped on Vietnam, three times the amount it took to defeat Germany and Japan in 1945. From single-engine Cessnas used for artillery spotting to high-altitude supersonic reconnaissance jets, anything that might help win the war flew over the jungles of Vietnam. Codenamed Operation Rolling Thunder, the air war against North Vietnam was a seven-year assault that began in March 1965. Originally, it was a political campaign not to destroy military targets, although we would hit military targets, but to show the North Vietnamese that we had resolved the same as they did. But the communists saw American restraint as revealing a lack of resolve. And fear of escalating the war led the White House to place vital enemy targets off limits. Secretary McNamara and the president drew a 30-mile circle around Hanoi and a 15-mile circle around Haiphong, and we were not allowed to, uh, to hit targets in there without the very specific permission. Uh, it doesn't take too many smarts to, to figure out uh, what the ground rules are, and the North Vietnamese simply moved everything they had uh, within the protected areas. Rolling Thunder relied on the doctrine of graduated response. Keep hitting the enemy slightly harder than he hits you, and eventually he will capitulate. The graduated response was a colossal military failure. We was, in essence, a training program. We taught them our weapons and our methods of fighting over a protracted period of time at not too much cost to them, so that they became a very, very powerful and dangerous and clever and well-equipped adversary. To counter the enemy's increasing strength, American air power struck deeper into North Vietnam. The country was divided into six sections, known as route packages. As we moved further north, the package numbers increased until we got up to the Hanoi and Haiphong area, and that was uh, route pack six, the big league. From 1965 through 67, the bulk of the assault up north was carried out by the F-105 Thunder Chief, nicknamed the Thud for its heavy-bodied design. A single-seat fighter bomber, the 105 weighed over 25 tons fully armed and could achieve a speed of Mach 2.2. Originally designed for high-speed nuclear strikes, the Thud was modified to carry over six tons of conventional ordnance. The uh, 105 with its speed on the deck, its weapons carrying capability and its ability to take a hit and in many cases survive and get back to friendly territory uh, made it the airplane that did 75% of the actual work against uh, Route Pack 6. The F-105 struck at traditional military targets, 
radar sites, bridges, rail lines, roads. These sites were soon well defended by batteries of SAM-2 missiles that inflicted heavy losses. In less than a year, North Vietnam tripled its number of SAM launchers. In response, the F-105 was continually updated. New avionics, extra armor, a secondary flight control system. But with thousands of sorties flown each month, the 105 and its pilots paid an ever higher price. In 1967, the worst year, they lost 113 F-105s. In the whole Rolling Thunder campaign, they lost more than 400. And flying those airplanes were the cream of the tactical air command pilots, the deep penetration attack pilots. More sophisticated aircraft were rushed into service. The Navy A-6 Intruder was the first fully integrated all-weather attack plane. Its highly complex avionic system was initially unreliable. And in typical American fashion, the US Navy said, get this airplane doing what it's advertised to do. So they put every possible effort into it. They had the electronics manufacturers, the aircraft manufacturers in the carriers working on that airplane to get the thing to work. And they did. It was Vietnam which turned the A-6 into a working operational airplane. The A-6 was a marvelous airplane because it could take off from a carrier at night or in bad weather. With the pilot and the bombardier navigator, the two of them never looking outside the canopy, by radar and by electronic sensors could fly a mission over the north, pinpoint bombing accuracy, and return to their carrier. It carried a big bomb load, it had an enormous range, had a two-man side-by-side crew, and it was a very effective weapon against fixed targets up north. The skies over Vietnam soon filled with attack aircraft. The F-100 Super Sabre was the world's first supersonic fighter. The F-111 became the greatest interdiction aircraft of its day, but only one plane had the flexibility to perform almost any mission, the F-4 Phantom. Powered by two J-79 after-burning turbojets able to climb 28,000 feet a minute, the Phantom was so effective that over 5,000 were ordered by air forces around the world. They were really remarkable in, in what they could do, and, and uh, they would bolt on uh, one set of armament for one mission one day, and the next day they would, uh, the pilot would come out and have a different mission and an entirely different array of armament on board. An extraordinary airplane by anybody's standards. The Phantom has unusually high wing loading for a supersonic jet, keeping it steady even under difficult conditions. It was originally designed as a long-range, very fast interceptor of enemy bombers based on aircraft carriers. It had to therefore fly at twice the speed of sound, but yet be docile enough to make an approach at 120 knots onto the carrier deck. It turned out to be such a superb airplane that uh, the Navy adapted it to other uses and it was adapted by the Air Force. It just had such power that it was able to perform superbly. But the pilots themselves uh, always felt frustrated because they were artificially inhibited from using these weapons to their full potential. The rules of engagements were such that uh, they could not apply the full firepower and the full capabilities they had at their disposal. One restriction on all U.S. pilots was a command and control structure that concentrated decision-making at the top. As President Johnson himself said, they can't bomb an outhouse without my permission. On one occasion, we had a major who was leading a, a flight of four, and he had just cranked up and was headed for the end of the runway when a phone call came through from Washington with a demand from the Secretary of Defense uh, to speak to the flight leader. The major came into operations and uh, Mr. McNamara gave him a direct order to download his napalm. We finally got to the point where Lyndon Johnson was practically a rifle company commander and Robert McNamara was practically a 105 flight leader. 
Rolling Thunder had begun with 1,500 sorties a month. By late 1967, American pilots were flying 23,000 missions over Vietnam each month with no signs of strategic gain and no end in sight. With sheer force failing to turn the tide, the U.S. turned to innovative technology. Widespread use of sophisticated electronics brought a new term to the military lexicon, the automated battlefield. Electronic warfare came to a new level in Vietnam. It had been used in World War II, a little bit in Korea. In Vietnam, we flew electronic surveillance aircraft, which would try to identify North Vietnamese radars, try to intercept North Vietnamese radio communications. Then we would send that aircraft to bomb the radar sites and bomb the communications centers. EV-66s supported strike forces by detecting and jamming enemy radar. We tried, as our planes flew over the north, just to jam all of the Vietnamese radar at various times, to give them electronically so many targets that they didn't know where to fire their missiles. They didn't know which were real aircraft and which were radar-invented aircraft or fake echoes. American technology was often countered by Vietnamese resourcefulness. The North Vietnamese had an uncanny ability to use anything that they could get their hands on, and a lot of the times they used U.S. equipment uh, against us. The bomblets that, that didn't detonate, that we dropped by the hundreds of thousands over there. And when they didn't go off and uh, didn't explode, the Vietnamese were able to retrieve those and use them as landmines. The North Vietnamese were adept at challenging sophisticated aircraft with the simplest of weapons. If you happen to go by a rural town, the people were firing at you with rifles and even pistols. You could see them laying on their back, shooting straight up in the air. And one slug from something like that could knock an airplane down. The Navy lost 13 helicopters in the Vietnam War, and all 13 were to small arms fire. And uh, almost all of those over North Vietnam were on rescue attempts. People pop out with an AK-47 and they put down the knife and fork, run outside and shoot up the helicopter. Airmen who ejected carried radios susceptible to enemy deception. Occasionally those radios would fall into enemy hands and they would get an English speaker on there and try and decoy rescue forces in there into what they, they call a flak trap. And they get a helicopter in there where he's most vulnerable and they just open up on him. That happened several times. U.S. technology did have notable successes, including warfare's first use of laser-guided bombs. A target would be painted, so to speak, illuminated with a laser uh, beam. And this could be done from a uh, orbiting transport, an orbiting F-4, some other airplane. And then the attacking airplane's laser bomb locks on to that illuminated target and, and homes right into it. It becomes the, the homing signal for it. Deployed too late in the war and too infrequently to be decisive, laser-guided bombs immediately showed their future promise by destroying the Paul Dume and Hamrung bridges. They'd raided those bridges with all kinds of aircraft, all kinds of bombs, for literally years, and they'd never knocked them out. And with a laser-guided bomb, one raid on each, finish, problem solved. A continuing frustration for American commanders was the enemy's ability to keep supplies flowing to Viet Cong guerrillas in the south. Often forced to travel at night over rugged jungle trails, the communists carried tons of weapons on bicycles or on their backs. This human transport system was countered by a highly sophisticated electronic strategy codenamed Igloo White. Igloo White was an effort to sew sensors along the Ho Chi Minh Trail, the principal route for carrying arms from North Vietnam through Laos into South Vietnam. With Igloo White, aircraft dropped unmanned sensors along the trail. And then as the sensors detected uh, movement of troops, movement of vehicles, signals would be sent up to an aircraft, would be relayed by the aircraft to a command center in South Vietnam, and then attack aircraft, bombers, fighter bombers, would be dispatched to attack those specific targets. 
After five years of intensive top secret scientific work, the plan was fully operational by 1969. Very technically successful, but when you stop to think about it, if you have uh, a $30 million orbiting reconnaissance aircraft to transmit the signals and a $20 million command post and you call in four $10 million fighters to assault a convoy of five $5,000 trucks carrying $2,000 worth of rice, it's easy to see that it's not cost effective. This was a self-inflicted wound. We, we chose to fight a high-tech war against a resourceful, low-tech enemy and it was a losing proposition. There was no way we could win it on that basis. The primary interdictor of traffic along the Ho Chi Minh Trail was a 10-year-old plane that became the most terrifying weapon of the war, the B-52 Stratofortress. B-52 is a swept-wing, eight-engined, long-range bomber. It can refuel in flight. It can carry virtually any weapon. Originally designed to carry nuclear warheads over Russia, the B-52 was converted to hold vast stores of 500 and 750 pound iron bombs. In December of 1965, the planes underwent a so-called Big Belly modification, increasing their bomb load to 60,000 pounds, 10 times the capacity of the famed B-17 in World War II. They would squat at the end of the runway, a black smoke boiling out from them. They're down on their shocks because they're so heavy, their wings are drooping. Finally, by the end of the runway, they would struggle into the air and, and become airborne. The B-52 missions, designated Operation Arclight, were grueling nine-hour round trips from Anderson Air Force Base in Guam. Once over their jungle target, the bombers attacked in arrowhead formations of three planes each to maximize destruction in a mile by half mile area. And when these things came down to earth, they would simply make a carpet of destruction, which was unbelievable. The B-52 flies high, and you can neither, in the jungle, you could neither see it nor hear it coming, and they had no radar there. Um, so all of a sudden, the ground would simply erupt there would be a, a 30 second earthquake. There might or might not be anything left afterwards. They have to pull all these dead people out, and, and there's so many of them that they have to lay them on like, you ever see like, you know, um, shrimp in the packages? They set them up like that. The B-52s inflicted massive punishment when the enemy could be found but dense jungle cover and highly mobile Viet Cong forces made targeting difficult. This was the first war in history in which the greatest weight of bombing was done on our allies' country. We bombed our allies' country systematically to get rid of the insurgent forces instead of bombing the enemy country, the North Vietnamese. All that changed in December 1972. Safely re-elected, President Nixon implemented Linebacker II, the campaign that would finally end American involvement in Vietnam. Linebackers sought to destroy the ability and the will of North Vietnam to make war. By the end of Linebacker, every military target except prisons and hospitals could be targeted. Linebacker II hit Hanoi and Haiphong, the two industrial centers that had been off limits throughout the war. Fuel refineries, communication centers, and power lines were systematically destroyed, laying waste to the North's economy and infrastructure. The enemy's air defenses, minimal eight years earlier, were now the most intense in history, surpassing even Berlin at the height of World War II. They lost 26 B-52s in the whole Vietnam War. 15 of those went in the 11 days of the final linebacker operation. And that's when the defenses were at their wit's end and they were being so heavily jammed, the missile launch sites, that they were firing barrages of SAM-2s just straight up at the formations, visually aimed. And those bombers were flying through 30 or 40 missiles coming up at them 
flying through the formation. Linebacker 2 was halted when the North agreed to resume peace talks. Within months, a treaty would be signed and American forces withdrawn from Vietnam. Linebacker 2 was the last and mightiest strike of a long war. An uneasy peace had come to Vietnam. Vietnam has been called the first helicopter war. Thousands of choppers brought new mobility to the battlefield, engaging in transport, rescue, and assault. And when we got to Vietnam, we found that because of the fact that we had these various enclaves and we had terrible roads and we had a mine problem and everything else, that, that it was really the only way to travel. Without the helicopter, I'm not sure how we would have fought that war. The front lines were, were almost everywhere. And there was no secure area, even in the, in the major cities. The idea of aerial envelopment has been with us almost since the airplane. Uh, General Mitchell, for example, in the First World War, advocating landing airplanes behind the enemy lines and establishing machine gun nests so that you could have a strong point that the Germans couldn't attack. Uh, and that was in 1918. True vertical envelopment came about when you could transport troops by helicopter and place them on a specific spot with all their equipment concentrated. Helicopters were used like that in Korea and then they were used like that extensively in Vietnam. Vietnam's helicopter workhorse was the UH-1 Huey. Advanced models carried up to 14 troops or six stretchers and thousands were in constant service throughout the war. Although extremely vulnerable to small arms fire, Hueys were also remarkably resilient shot down as a relative thing, uh, in a fixed wing getting shot down is always uh, catastrophic for the aircraft. In the case of a helicopter, not necessarily. I was forced to land uh, and never crashed in a ball of fire like uh, some have, but I, I was forced down due to enemy fire on seven different occasions. Uh, on six of those, I was able subsequently to salvage the airplane, replace an engine, rotor blade, whatever it might be. The Huey became the first helicopter to carry extensive armaments. We put almost every kind of gun you could think of on, on various helicopters. First door mounts on the Hueys, later on we had chin mounts that would be controlled by the pilot to give the pilot some protection up front, coupled with the swivel guns in the door to give you some more firepower. Jerry Rig transports quickly evolved into the first true attack helicopter, the AH-1 Huey Cobra gunship. It featured a new, slimmer fuselage for greater speed and agility. Cobras were equipped with two M28 turrets, each holding 4,000 rounds or 300 grenades. Further firepower came from dozens of wing-loaded rockets. The name Cobra comes from the call sign of the unit which first used armed Huey helicopters as weapons, as distinct from transports. So feared were the Cobras, the enemy had to be goaded into challenging them. You try to get them to shoot at you, they'd expose their position. Would fly in the pairs. One of you would get down on the, the close to the trench lines, buzz the trench lines, and try to draw fire, and the other one would be up here in a position where they could go and make a rocket run or a machine gun run right behind you. Once you drew fire, uh, you kick your red smoke out and they'd go in and hit it. Have to expose ourselves and our crew uh, to a lot of uh, direct firepower, you know, sometimes you have to look the enemy right in the face. Perhaps the most hazardous helicopter missions were search and rescue. They developed a, the turbine-powered HH-3 uh, helicopters, the Jolly Greens, and then they made a much improved version, uh, the Super Jolly Green, that uh, had an aerial refueling capability and had many guns on board and had 195 mile an hour top speed. Uh, very, very effective uh, helicopter for the task. The Jolly Greens were ably supported by the A-1 Sky Raider, a World War II dinosaur nicknamed Sandy. They were wonderful, what we call RESCAP, Rescue Combat Air Patrol airplane, because they could carry enormous amounts of rockets and bullets and bombs, and these were the kinds of things they could use effectively to keep Vietnamese troops and Viet Cong away from a pilot long enough for the helicopter to go in and get them out. 
The problem with rescue is everybody knows where you have to go and everybody knows what you have to do and you have to come to a complete stop and just sit there while they get the guy and bring him into the aircraft or at least attach him to the rescue device. And in that period of time, the helicopter is incredibly vulnerable. When you're in a rescue and you're, you're stopped and the enemy's all around, it's as if every second takes about a month. Um, you can't believe how slowly people can run or how slowly the hoist will work or, or how long this is taking. It may be a matter of less than a minute, but it, you get out of there and you're aged far beyond your years. Despite improved hardware and the daring of courageous rescue teams, only one in six downed and alive Americans was rescued. Our ability to retrieve downed air crews uh, isn't any better now, after the Persian Gulf, than it was in Vietnam. And in Vietnam, it wasn't any better than it was in Korea. And in Korea, it wasn't any better than it was in World War II. And that's too bad. The principal vehicle for recovering uh, downed air crews who are in enemy territory uh, is the helicopter. It's slow and it's vulnerable and the results have always been dismal. Some of the benefits of an aggressive rescue effort are not easily quantified. The pilots going in, if they know that there's a chance for rescue and there's people that are going to come get them and are going to do their best, it gives them a little more confidence. It gives them just that little edge and sometimes that's all it takes. And for the rescuers, no duty could be more meaningful. There comes a point when you're far enough away from the threat and you start to climb up and you can slow the aircraft down and take a breath and maybe light a cigarette with your shaking hands. You sit there and you go, we did a good thing there. And then years later, um, when you run into somebody that you rescued and he comes up and says, hey, thank you. And you go, well, who are you? Oh, you picked me up back in 72. Oh, that's nice. And then you go home that night, and for many nights that thereafter, and you go, I did a real good thing. The driver's coming up. Airmen are trained from day one to focus all their energies on getting the job done. Thoughts of danger must be pushed aside, put out of mind. But air crews that fly into combat still recognize the risks of facing enemy fire, the risk of being shot down, or worse. Our job with American fighters was to penetrate deep into enemy territory, do bombing, and then do dogfighting. Whereas the uh, MiG-21s, the MiG-17s, MiG-19s, which were opposing it, were small point defense interceptors. And so you had a big McDonnell Phantom having to dogfight with a light and maneuverable MiG-21. The air crews who were successful flying the Phantom over North Vietnam were the ones who understood that art called energy maneuverability. It was not an agile airplane, not as agile as the MiGs by a long shot. It could not outturn the MiGs, but it could out accelerate them and it could outperform them in terms of zooming and high speed. And it was very, very solid at low altitude. Communist MiGs disrupted bombing runs of older and slower aircraft like the F-105, but avoided challenging the Phantom. Frustrated by the MiG's refusal to engage in dogfights, an American commander devised a brilliant trap. Colonel Robin Olds decided that they would set up a flight of Phantoms, but send them up in a typical F-105 formation, use F-105 call signs, uh, use F-105 jargon, so that they would appear on the communist radar screens as a flight of 105s coming in. And it worked. Uh, the MiGs came up, and to their dismay, they found out that they weren't attacking out fleet of 105s, but instead of a formation of F-4s, and 12 MiGs were shot down, including two by Robin Olds himself. The greatest threat to U.S. airmen was ground fire from SAMs and AAA. Pilots could be caught unaware when SAMs burst through cloud cover. The first time I knew that we had trouble was when Two of them screeched between my wingman and myself. 
the sound and the, uh, the incandescent light from the rear end of those rockets is almost undescribable. It paralyzes everything in your system. Uh, all your nerve endings in your stomach just, just lock up and you, you just don't, can't comprehend uh, what is going on with these huge railroad trains with fire in their tail roaring. To avoid hitting Chinese technicians, SAM sites were off limits until they became active. The entire war was conducted under rules of engagement which were calculated to make it difficult for the American fighting man to succeed. Uh, many areas of Vietnam, North Vietnam, were off limits. SAM sites could be seen being built, but they were off limits until the weapons were installed and they were ready to take offensive action, which is one of the most foolish possible concept for warfare to permit an enemy to set up to hurt you before you took him out. And yet, those were the conditions that the uh, armed forces operated under for almost the entire period of the war. Target restrictions allowed the enemy to concentrate their defenses. The outstanding example is the Northeast Railway, which is a single track railway from Hanoi to the supply point on the Chinese border. Uh, in one 10 mile stretch there, that was the only thing available to us because the Hanoi restricted area and the Haiphong restricted area and the 30 mile wide border restricted area protected all of that railroad, all of its switching yards, except for one little 10 mile stretch. On that stretch, the intensity of the guns was such that there was one anti-aircraft gun every 48 feet. And that's pretty tough to, to uh, compete against. The way you fight a SAM is just like you fight another airplane. If you can see him, you've got a pretty good chance of beating him because he's long and skinny like a big white telephone pole, so he can't turn very well. You turn into him just like you're turning into another fighter and usually maybe 10 o'clock or 2 o'clock position on, and you hold that position as long as you can, and then you break as hard as you can, and if he tries to break with you, he stalls out, augers in right on top of the people who fired him. Special missions were designed to seek out and destroy SAMs. Flown by different aircraft collectively known as wild weasels, these flights detected emissions from SAM radar receivers and then attacked with Shrike or Harm anti-radiation missiles. It was a great cat and mouse game because the enemy would turn off their radars so you couldn't find them. They'd turn them on at the last moment, lock on to an aircraft, fire a missile and then switch off again. Russia and China replaced the SAMs as fast as they could be destroyed, but the missiles downed hundreds of airmen. There were times when men on the ground told the rescue forces, don't bring a helicopter in here. That, to me, takes a lot of courage to, to sit there and consciously you know, cut your last lifeline. Navy Captain David Carey was shot down in August, 1967. His harshest treatment came during initial interrogations. The pain was so incredible that I knew that I was gonna go crazy. Uh, they wouldn't hurt me, they wouldn't they wouldn't kill me. I begged them to kill me. They wouldn't kill me. They just hurt me. Um, and, and I knew I was going to go crazy. The pain was just incredible. And so what I decided to do was hold out to the last possible second and then lie. And we got to the last possible second. Um, and so I started lying. I lied about everything you can imagine. They wanted to know the targets. I made up a target. And then they said, well, see, you do know. <laughs> So I think it was crazy. It was just crazy. There were two ways you could live over there. You could be a pessimist or you could be an optimist. And there wasn't much percentage in being a pessimist. For one thing, it didn't take much for us to decide that release was imminent, that we were going to be out of there soon. I mean, if the guards would just unlock the doors in the morning and um, smile, we knew he knew something. And so the rumor would spread, we must be getting out of here soon. The guards smiled this morning. Yeah, better get ready. And so we'd get ready. I believe wholeheartedly that our treatment changed and our conditions improved uh, because of the activities that were going on in the United States on our behalf.
In uh, 69, Americans started wearing uh, bracelets with our names on them and shoot-down dates. There were letter-writing campaigns initiated on our behalf to the uh, North Vietnamese delegation in Paris and in Hanoi. Ross Perot was flying around with an airplane load of Christmas presents trying to get them into us. We became an object of uh, very much interest in the United States. And I think for all of those reasons, it suddenly dawned on the North Vietnamese that we were going to be worth something and that life meant something different to Americans. One of our major preoccupations was trying to get everybody's names out or memorize everybody's names so that we would know who was there and who wasn't there and nobody would just disappear. We had people, for example, that had every American's name memorized with whom anybody had contact. And they'd have 300 names in their heads, all listed alphabetically. Anybody that flew over the North was a hero. They knew that there really wasn't much good that was going to come out of it, but they went, and they went because it was their job. And they did their job to their absolute best. They were a phenomenal group of people. Uh, I don't think this country's ever turned out a better bunch. The policy was amongst us that we were all going home together. Nobody was going home early. Nobody was going to be left behind. We were coming home together. One day, they dressed us in uh, civilian clothes, and loaded us on a bus, and drove us out to Jilam, the airport in Hanoi. And there sat a United States Air Force airplane. I think that's when I really believed we're going home this time. And then we went through a small receiving line and were escorted out to the airplane. At which point, we didn't need an airplane to fly. <laughs> in Vietnam, the jungle was everywhere and affected everything. Forced to do battle on a hidden and bewildering terrain, Americans sought to change the landscape to their advantage. Developed late in World War II, napalm was brutally effective in jungle fighting. Napalm is itself a jelly and gasoline uh, that's detonated over an extreme area, and it has two effects. One, it burns people to death, and two, it uh, deprives the area of oxygen for a sufficient period of time to asphyxiate people, particularly people in bunkers and things like that. So it's a, it's a terribly effective weapon. You can actually smell this human dying. 15, 20 men, they sit, dying, dead, gone, finished. The napalm run was always different from any other kind of a run. It was very low and very shallow angle, and there was no machine guns going off normally from the airplanes. It was strictly a, a low pass with a weapon and then low release and then the explosion. A vast effort to overcome the natural terrain was attempted in Operation Ranch Hand. Starting in 1961, Six million acres of South Vietnamese land was sprayed with 18 million gallons of defoliants. The aim? Expose Viet Cong supply depots hidden deep in the jungle maze. They sprayed it over Hill and Dale, mile after mile after mile. They devastated thousands and thousands of acres of, of, of primary jungle. One of those technological efforts like Igloo White, which on the whole, caused as much damage to the friendly side as it did to the enemy. There was not enough defoliant in the world to kill that jungle. The jungle was just an, you know, like an enormous growth, and it would grow so fast. Literally, it would hide the downed airplane in a matter of days, just, just by growing over it. It was just a, a living thing, and to think you could kill it with Agent Orange was, was a joke. Shifting battlefields demanded that weapons be versatile and adaptable. Among the most successful was the C-130 transport, then and now the backbone of American tactical air support. A high-wing four-engine craft, it ferried troops and supplies to the war theater. It landed when other planes couldn't, and when landing was impossible, it used a parachute extraction system to drop supplies. When a Marine garrison found itself under siege for 78 days at Quezon, only the C-130 was capable of providing desperately needed supplies. If you landed at Quezon, they had machine gun positions at each end of the runway, so your final approach or your takeoff, they'd be shooting at you. I recall at one point, 
when I was filling sandbags with my my squad members, and one of them looking up and yelling, hey, look at that. And I looked around in time to see a Silver C-130 flying in, and it was fully engulfed in flames. And I saw it go down on the runway. Apparently, the crew had been killed. I can vividly remember seeing that plane come around on fire and then hitting the runway. We never lost our air supply, and we never lost our air cover. Had we have lost our air supply, then I believe we would have been besieged and we would have had some serious problems there. By dropping a big blue, a 15,000 pound explosive, the C-130 could instantly clear a helicopter landing zone. In 1968, the transport gained its own firepower when it was converted into the AC-130 gunship. With cannons, mini guns, and an inexhaustible supply of ammunition, the AC-130 was a devastating weapon. If you had a Gatling gun that could fire 6,000 rounds a minute, and each round of 20 millimeter cost a pound, then every minute the gun was firing three tons of bullets. So you had to be able to lift a lot of ammunition in order to stay in the air and do an effective job. The 130 could do that. The AC-130 would attack in a circular flight pattern, shooting sideways to concentrate a cone of fire against a single ground target. The 130 employed an electronic infrared aiming system that saw through the night. They would fly uh, over the Ho Chi Minh Trail and uh, get the signals of the trucks and the trucks would be illuminated either by flares or other means and uh, then they, this high power firepower weaponry would take them out very very effective weapons twenty five months after the withdrawal of american forces from vietnam communist forces overran the south in the rush to evacuate friendlies from Saigon, American aircraft would once again be called upon. We get to the airport, and when you get there, you can actually see people, just like thousands and thousands of people, stand out there in the gate and get ready to climb over the fence or jump through the fence just to be in to the airport so they can sneak it out. Around about 2.45, you know, we are getting ready to pack it up and get ready to airplane get ready to take it off. And you can actually see all this North Vietnam people, they're just like all over out there because you know you can look through the window and see, you know, the communism's out there getting ready to shoot us down when we take it off. We take off, they're shooting at us. Very scary. And we got out of there. On the final flight out of Saigon, one C-130 transport with a normal passenger load of 90 carried 437 refugees to safety. Operation Rolling Thunder was complete. The civilian leaders who initiated Rolling Thunder believed that superior American firepower and technology would prevail. But even as early as 1964, Admiral George Anderson expressed a contrary view. Our nation, wrote Anderson, will defy every lesson of history if we think that stockpiles of weapons or the decisions of computers win wars. Man, his wits and his will, is still the key to war and peace, victory and defeat. Thank you for watching this edition of the Voices of the Enlisted Video Collection. Proceeds from this program directly support the Air Force Sergeants Association and all it does for you. By collecting these videos, you honor the commitment and dedication of America's heroes and support our mission to improve quality of life and economic fairness for the well-being of Air Force enlisted personnel and their families for generations to come.